talk a little bit about degenerative disease. And so degenerative disease like is uh, one of those things. I mean, like, I, I think it's like one of the reasons like people hate spine imaging because it's like so repetitive. There's so much terminology associated with it. You start out doing it and it's just like frustrating because we're just, we the fellows or attendings are just like spewing out terms and you're just like writing them down. You're like, yeah, yeah, moderate, moderate. So yeah. But uh, it is extremely common and it's extremely painful for the patients. And like when you find it, you can, you can help them a lot. Um, like I said, it's symptomatic. I mean, like the diseases are painful. It impinges the spaces, you impinge the spinal canal, you impinge the nerve roots, and that's a problem. Um, there's also like a lot of different ways that things can go wrong. You can have discs, facets, all of those structures like can, uh, can sort of get messed up. Now, there's this uh, paper uh, that sort of came out. I think it's, it's actually in several different journals. Uh, one is, this is the version that's in spine. I think there's like another one that's in a, one of the different surgical journals called uh, lumbar disc nomenclature. This is the second version. There's one from, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. This paper is great. I don't really care like about re telling you to read as recommends. Like most of your learning is like in the reading room and like is reading about your individual cases. This paper is actually worth like picking up and taking a look. But I'm going to spare you that because we're just going to go through the most uh, relevant parts today. But this is where all the terminology comes from. The difference between a bulge and a protrusion. All of those things are, are in there. We'll go over that today. But if you need to go back and look at that, it's like in great detail. Like, and uh, the pictures are really great. And uh, I'll show you some of them here. Uh, so this is like a normal disc, like what a normal disc looks like. And uh, so here, again, it's sort of like similar to the image we were looking at before. This is at the level of the disc. Uh, here you can see this is labeled AF, so that's annulus fibrosis. So it's like this fibrous ring. And then you have this sort of like juicy center here, like the candied center. That's the nucleus pulposus. And that's like a softer tissue that can actually sort of like squeeze out there. The fibers like are oriented like this. And uh, sort of the strength is like all around the periphery of the disc. This is sagittal, this is coronal. Uh, so that's like sort of normally what it looks like. Now, the discs can degenerate, like over time you get older, your connective tissues like aren't quite as great. So the disc, like the, uh, the annulus kind of starts to get cracks in it. And uh, then these are called annular fissures. So you get these little cracks in them and they can be oriented different ways. It's sort of like the spine equivalent of a meniscus. You have like different meniscal tears that are oriented in different ways. It's the same. This one's transverse, this one's radial, this one's circumferential. We never really comment on that like in a report. But just be aware that like these are weaknesses in the in the disc and they can actually be painful uh, so people like if you have them like you should mention them especially if they weren't present now they're very careful to use the word annular fissure and this like comes from sort of litigiousness of sort of like the spine uh, literature like sort of a while back because people would put the word tear and that like kind of implies that correctly or not that sort of implies that it was there and something acutely happened and now it's gone, like an ACL tear. Like you were playing soccer and you tore your ACL and now you have an ACL tear. <laughs> um, these are chronic degenerative things that, uh, that go on. Um, don't use the word tear, uh, use the word fissure. It's correct and like it, it avoids, those, avoids those implications. So just don't, just don't say that. Disc herniations. So herniation is like, you're talking to like your grandma and she's like, I got a herniated disc. It's like the general sort of like layman terminology that like covers basically every kind of pathology where the disc goes beyond its expected boundary. I really don't use this term at all. I don't say that someone has a herniated disc. I don't say that, you know, there's a disc herniation, not because it's a bad term, but it's an umbrella term. And it includes all of these other terms that are more specific and tell you more about what the actual pathology is. But if you're talking to your grandma, you can say like, yeah, you know, I help people find their disc herniations and she'll, she'll feel proud of you. <laughs> she'll be like, I thought you were the one who presses the button on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this front is, you know, so all of these pictures are going to be from that same paper. Like if you look at A, like on the left, it's normal. And uh, so once it starts to extend beyond those boundaries, like then it becomes a bulge. And uh, they, they divide bulges between symmetric. So the whole thing is just bulging out in every direction and asymmetric. So whether where it's larger on one side. So see you have it like standing to the left here. 
And so to, for it to still be a bulge though, it needs to be more than 25% of the circumference. So kind of, so here you have, it's like, you know, roughly half, but it's still like a little, a little asymmetric. Uh, the reason that 25% is important is like once you get less than 20 25%, then you start using this term protrusion. And that refers to a smaller bulge that takes up less, uh, less sort of space. Here, I mean, this artist like is awesome. Like I, it saves me like a lot of trouble drawing these drawings. Um, yeah, so you have this disc, it's coming out here. It's like clearly not the normal contour. It's clearly less than 25%, but it's clearly big enough to, to cause a problem here. Here he's like uh, drawn like sort of a schematic of those like annular fibers sort of tearing and it becoming weak there uh, over time. Uh, probably like someone, right, the radiologist, like sitting too long, like on call, uh, has got a disc protrusion there. Uh, now the other important thing about this is that it's wider at the base than it is sort of distally. That's what defines it at a, as a protrusion. Uh, once you sort of get a complete tear like through that, those annular fibers, and it's kind of contained, then you get an extrusion. So extruding, like for those of you guys who do like engineering or something, like extrusion is like sort of the Play-Doh fun factory, like where you have the Play-Doh and it like presses through like the little mold and it's kind of coming out. That's the manufacturing process of extrusion. This is the equivalent of when you're manufacturing a horrible disc. Um, so here you have like a, a sort of a little bit of annular fiber that's remaining, but it's wider out here than it is than it is here. Uh, and then finally, sort of the the, the sort of last uh, sort of on the spectrum is a sequestration, and that's like basically an extrusion that's sort of gone to the point where that little tether has broken, and then you have disc material that's sort of just hanging free. Now this is important to mention in your reports. Because if a surgeon goes in and like and has to deal with this, and if there's a still a little bulge here, and he goes in and does a microdiscectomy and takes out the bulge, but leaves a sequestered fragment. I mean, this one like you wouldn't miss because it's right there. But many times they'll be like down here. If the surgeon leaves it in, that's a huge problem for the patient because he went in and did surgery and then left the fragment that was causing the problem. So when you have like sequestration, uh, you should mention it. It's, it's useful to mention where the fragment has migrated. So has it migrated below the disc? Has it migrated above the disc? That's useful to them. Uh, I think about this like that movie Gravity. It's like George Clooney, he's like flying off into space. He's not tethered anymore. I like how it says, don't let go. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Um, in any case, think about it like that. It's not tethered anymore. It's uh, sort of lost its connection. Schmoral's nodes. Schmoral's nodes, that's like one of those things where you're like a first year resident and you're like, Schmoral? Like, what did he say? <laughs> you know, so you write it down phonetically. Power Scribe will get it. Um, Schmoral's nodes are disc herniations that are going through the end plate of the disc. So it's like an intravertebral herniation. I'm pretty sure if you tell Power Scribe intravertebral herniation, it will mess it up every time. So I guess maybe it's better that they're called Schmoral's nodes. Um, but so you see like it's actually herniating through, in this case, it's the superior end plate. They can go either way. They can enhance, they can be painful. So they can be causes of pain, but we tend to blow them off. Like, I mean, because they're so common and it really tends to be like, not that, uh, not that big a deal, but do be aware that they're there. They can be mistaken for metastatic disease. Uh, many times like people will call and they'll be like, this person has breast cancer. I think I see a met and it will be just a schmorals node. Uh, so definitely like be aware of that. Also be aware of the fact, don't call everything a schmorals node. If you call a met a schmorals node, then that's not good either. But, but do be aware, like when you see it's like in contiguity with the, the, uh, the disc material, that's kind of going down. You can definitely get like avid enhancement around the margin. Uh, so just be aware of it. So these locations are sort of defined in, uh, in these, in this paper as well, sort of like where the disc. So these are like the descriptors of like how to say like where the disc is going. Um, just suffice it to say that like these exist. This is kind of the central zone. Uh, this we most commonly call like the lateral recess because of what we talked about already. But I think technically they call it the subarticular zone. Here's the foraminal zone and then kind of extra foraminal zone. So these descriptors are useful. If you see like a disc protrusion like out here, I mean, that's different than a disc protrusion that's in here because the symptoms may be different. The surgical approach may be different. So it's a useful terminology to use like uh, to kind of let them know what's going on. End plate degenerative changes, like end plates can look awful. They can enhance, 
they can like have a lot of abnormal signal just from degenerative disease. Uh, this guy, Mike Modick, who was like, a, he's a neuroradiologist at Cleveland Clinic, uh, sort of, I went to medical school in Cleveland. The guy was pretty funny. Like he had like moved on to being like a full-time administrator and was like not, not really into doing radiology anymore. But uh, he sort of, uh, he, he, he basically described these findings where these end plates gradually change over time. Pretty much no one here is using this description. I don't know if it's like an East Coast thing and like they just like it more there. Perhaps we don't describe it here because it's just not that important. It really doesn't make a difference. But suffice it to say that you have edema first, then it kind of becomes fatty and then it becomes sclerotic. And if you think about it that way, then you can kind of keep track of like what the signal like should be like. So edema is bright on T2 and then fat sort of tends to be kind of bright on both. And by the time it gets sclerotic, then you're sort of dark, uh, dark on both there. So you can have other degenerative changes, like the facets can degenerate. You can have fluid in them. You can get osteophytes, so you can get like bone deposition, like along the discs. You can get bone deposition, excuse me, along the uncinate processes. You can get bone deposition adjacent to the facets, and that tends to narrow like all those spaces. And uh, then you have this like uncinate process sort of degeneration that we that we talked about a little bit. Uh, the ligamentum flavum like can get thick or redundant as well. Uh, so then you think about well why why is this like a problem? So you have your like disc, you have your facet, you have your ligamentum flavum, you have like a little bit of room there for the spinal canal. But then like you get you know your disc starts to bulge out and like then that spinal canal like gets a little narrow. Where those nerve roots come out get a little narrow as well. In your facets, they get like a little degenerated, and then you have you sort of lose that neural foraminal space as well. And then you get your ligamentum flavum like it's a little thicker, and suddenly your spinal canal is significantly smaller than it was before. So this combination of disease can sort of lead to these problems. It's useful if you only have one or two of these components to tell them why their spinal canal narrowing. If it's like all the disc, then tell them it's all the disc. If it's a combination of these things, that's useful as well. Because if it's just a disc, maybe they can go in and do a microdiscectomy. If it's all of these things, well, I mean, they have to do like a sort of bigger approach. Same thing on the lateral. You sort of have a disc, you have the facet. They sort of tend to, the disc like sort of bulges out, kind of grows, the facet kind of hypertrophies. And suddenly that nerve root there, which was like sitting pretty, like with a nice little fat around it, is now like getting dinged by the combination of, of factors there. That's what causes the, uh, the narrowing there. Grading, it's like, oh man, it's like your English teacher like grading an essay, it's super subjective. Uh, but usually like people do three grades, they'll say that it's mild, moderate, or severe. For the spine, it's usually like based on how much CSF is left. If you have a little bit, they'll call it, I mean, if you only have a little bit of narrowing, you'll call it mild. If you have none left, you'll call it severe. If there's abnormal cord signal, that's the most worrisome thing. Neural foraminal stenosis, it's kind of the same way, okay? Subjective grading. It's a little bit easier because you kind of have this fat around it. If you kind of lose the fat in one direction, like people will call it mild. If you're kind of losing the fat in two directions, like then they'll call it moderate. And if you just have, if you can only see just soft tissue in the neural foramen, then like people will call it severe. Disc osteophyte complex, like what the heck is that? People use that term. I, some people use it more than others. I do think it's useful like in some, some situations. People use that to talk about a combination like of a disc and sort of that calcified osteophyte uh, that you get. There's an example that I have here. So here you have like a little bit of degenerative disease in the cervical spine. Again, it's like better seen on this TV here, but so you got like a disc coming out. And uh, if you kind of zoom in on it a little bit, what you see is that you have that you sort of have an osteophyte like so it's there's actually like new bone forming sort of around around this part here and then disc as well and you see how it's like all lumpy bumpy over here like discs tend to be like sort of smooth like those drawings uh once you start getting bone formation there then you kind of get this sort of like lumpy uh sort of appearance there that's like when i would use a term like disc osteophyte complex that's the same as saying there's a disc protrusion and the disc is partially calcified. That's really kind of all you're saying. The importance is that if they go in there with a soft instrument, there, it's gonna be harder for them to take out that tissue than, than otherwise. 
So in summary, we'll skip through this like pretty quickly, but uh, pretty much like you can look at that paper based on the size of like how much disk is coming out. That's how you know what to call it. Now you hear us call like things like all the time. Now these terms, the, these three sets of terms are the same, okay? Like people will say, oh yeah, there's facet hypertrophy, there's facet arthrosis, there's facet arthropathy. There's probably some implications like of these terms, but they're for practical purposes, they're used interchangeably. People will tell you, oh, there's like ligamentum flavum. Like when it gets thick on the image, people tend to say there's ligamentum flavum thickening. Uh, but then some purist like wants to say like, well, that's impossible. The ligamentum flavum doesn't grow. Well, whatever. It's <laughs> <laughs> some people believe that it becomes that it's like redundant, and that when you have loss of height, that it's like infolded on itself, and that's what's making it thicker in an individual slice. Some people believe that it's part of like a inflammatory process, like it's becoming thicker. You don't have to get into that argument. Just be aware that they're the same. And if the tenant you're reading out with likes one more than the other, then fine. Um, Uncinate hypertrophy, uncinate spurring, <coughs> uncovertebral hypertrophy, these all mean the same thing, okay? They're all referring to growth of those uncinate processes that are causing uh, some narrowing. Neuroforamen, as far as I can tell, this is like a made up word from Power Scribe. Um, People will get the point, but like if you want to be like more correct about that, it's a neural foramen. Neural foramen makes it sound like there's a nerve and it's got holes in it. Um, I don't know, maybe this is like one of my pet peeves. I hate foramen of Monroe too because people like leave the E at the end. Like uh, that's like my two, that's this is like my two, the worst, just those assholes. Uh, it doesn't do that. I have it going down. <laughs> I don't really care, but I, I think if you want to be like technically correct, like you should use like the, the actual terminology. What's even funnier, I think some of the templates actually have neuroforamen in it. That's the British version. The N-E-U-R-O. I have looked this up. There you go. This isn't Britain. <laughs> don't use it. <laughs> uh, oh. Because <laughs> I like Oh, no. Does being British like give your reports greater authenticity? It like gives a greater sense. It's like more more trusted. Um, this is like a good. It's a good history here. Like uh, this person that right food drop. Um, 